time. Hello, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, um, good night, wherever you are. I am Maya, uh, Nusa Sonic Project Manager. Uh, Nusa Sonic is a collaborative experimental sound and music cultures, a multi-year project by CTM Festival in Berlin, Play Freely Black IG in Singapore, Wasak Festival in Manila, Yes No Club in Jogja, initiated by Good Institute in Southeast Asia. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the discussion Tanning In, Sounding Off. This discussion will talk about Southeast Asia musical tuning system with Joey Peters um, from Singapore, Kiam Alami in Berlin, Rose Hausawat, Thailand, and Shei um, from Singapore based in London. The discussion is part of our Nusa Sonic program, Common Tonalities, that explores Southeast Asian tuning system and scales through modern music technologies for the creation of new music. Currently, we have an open call for participants, um, musicians living in Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia diaspora worldwide until tomorrow, 31st of October. I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Shei. Shei Tan is a senior lecturer and ethnomusicologist specializing in Sinophone and Southeast Asia world at Royal Holloway University of London. She is interested in impact past issues of music and the colonization, aspirational cosmopolitanism, and rest discourses in music scenes around the world with a view towards understanding marginality through the lens of intersectionality. So without further ado, I will hand um, this to uh, Che'i. So time and space yours. Thank you so much for convening this panel, Nusa Sonic, um, Maya, Chiwai, and um, Merv. Uh, as um, Maya mentioned, uh, I'm here to help uh, facilitate a panel discussion on Southeast Asian musical tuning systems. And I guess one of the um, uh, approaches that we are taking in this panel is to maybe think about how uh, we listen to sounds and musical cultures in Southeast Asia and around the world today with a lot of different kinds of biases. And one of the you know, most obvious biases is um, that of uh, 12 tone, um, approximately equal temperament um, musical systems in which the octave is divided into 12 parts. But actually this way of hearing the world or making music or making musical instruments and calibrating musical instruments or even calibrating the way we listen is relatively recent. Um, and that's not to say, you know, 12 tone systems uh, 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 are only um, used in the so-called um, dominant hegemonic uh, uh, political context. You know, they, they have existed in um, ancient China and, and other parts of the world as well. But it's uh, many alternative, or maybe I shouldn't even use the word alternative, because we are thinking of recalibrating the way we listen on a more equal playing field. So, so there are many ways in which um, uh, musical instruments and even the way we sing and listen to have been um, 
uh, organized um, uh, tonally and different kinds of tone structures around the world. Um, so this panel is organized um, in Southeast Asia by people from Southeast Asia. And we're going to maybe relocate the focus first to, to Southeast Asia to think about whether there um, is a way of opening up the way we listen um, to modern diatonic systems alongside the way we have traditional in many different ways listened to um, Southeast Asian sounds and music cultures. And then maybe we can also look at more um, contemporary uh, developments, uh, and that is where uh, some other uh, so, some of the members here can speak to in terms of how people code switch between twelve tone systems and let's say the Thai system, which is equi heptatonic, where the octave is divided um, equally into seven um, parts, and and then also what this means in terms of technology. You know, our mobile phones, our apps, um, the modern uh, synthesizer um, that you can find in standard musical shops um, on the high streets in shopping centers are all tend to be tuned towards um, uh, the 12 tone system. Whereas, you know, in, in um, the Gulf area in the Middle East, you can actually find um, uh, synthesizers that are made for, um, you know, different kinds of tuning systems in, in the Middle East. And some people would say they're microtonal, but microtonal, what even does that mean if we're going to recalibrate um, the playing field? Uh, and, and, you know, what does this mean technologically as well in the age of, you know, TikTok users um, and so on and so forth. So without further ado, I'll stop talking for a while. Um, and I would like to introduce our first speaker, Joe Peters, who is um, an independent music scholar specializing in music sustainability and digital services for integrated music education. And he served a long dual career in music and APIT at the National University of Singapore, first as a musical director and then associate director of multimedia um, at the Center for Instructional Technology. And um, Joe's work uh, on um, this big uh, ASEAN funded project Sonic Orders is, you know, very pivotal. Um, in terms of the pioneering research that he had done, um, if only because first and foremost, he just amassed such a huge archive and com compendium of recorded sounds from many different musical traditions and practices in Southeast Asia. So let us welcome Joe to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yi. Uh, yes, uh, you said the listeners are important and I think that's the focus of what I'm, I'm uh, trying to do now. Uh, just a minute. So I share that. I think everything is okay if you can see sonic orders and Tamal P. Uh, basically, sonic orders is your elements of music. So it's approached in many, many different ways. But from uh, some decades ago, I wanted to quantize it. That is the main difference in it. Okay. And that is, this is where... Okay, now basically in my career now, it spanned over five decades. I look at listening as a skill for all, as a skill. Uh, in other words, uh, music education has to change if we want to. Uh, some, uh, make uh, the 95% of the world, which is different from the 5% that is the tertian system, which Shirley talked about, the so-called 12-tone system, but it dominates the world. And in my calculations from emissions, uh, from radio, television, and so on, uh, it shows that 95% of the world uh, is, uh, is in the tertian system whether it's through uh, performance or even through academic study. And that 5%, which is so rich, especially in Southeast Asia, we are still trying to find a way of uh, around it. Now, the, the basic uh, uh, literature on sonic orders is limited to the publishing the published uh, works under ASEAN. 
It's a major project with two volumes and 15 CDs, but the CDs are related to the text. And that is the whole direction in which I went. And uh, there, there are some more uh, technologies that will come up in a while. And my PhD thesis, which was Sonic Orders, creating it as a macro measure for music education. And then there are various published works and so on all over the place. Comparative World Sonic Environment Study is what I'm working on now. I've returned to Singapore after moving around Asia, particularly Thailand, for the last six, seven year, years. Uh, the, com the comparative aspect, I hope there will be enough time to show it to you, but basically I would think that uh, the first uh, instance when I came across uh, a problem with uh, a problem with uh, what is this? It's, okay, 1965, when I had, I was a, a school boy, but I was in charge of the first uh, school band that became a military band or symphonic band on the field. And we normally transcribe music for what we hear and then we arrange it without musical background. We just go by the sound. But in 1965, the boys posed me a, a big problem they selected a piece from a record and asked, and that means I had to transcribe it with the limited skills I had, had from violin, learning the violin. So I used the method of listening to the recorder, trying to transfer it to the piano and then to the score. And I found that the record, the piano were different. I didn't expect it and I didn't understand it also, but I went through the transcription and I had to make the uh, uh, alteration in the way I heard the sound. And I finally produced the score for the band. And they played it successfully. But somebody came up to me after the performance. He was the ambassador of Canada. And apparently he said, I played the national anthem of Canada as the <laughs> slow march, which I transcribed, you see. So in this was my early music education that you need to have classes by people who knew and to guide you. And I couldn't find it. And as I went along, 1978, I was enthralled by the Filipino Rondalia because I studied at University of Philippines. And uh, I found that all Rondalia companies were tuning their Rondalias to templates. They could not explain why the differences in sound occurred in pitch and in pitch hierarchy too. So you got the pitch interval and the pitch level, which orchestras face today, because you can't find an orchestra that is tuned to the so-called A440. So there are two indicators there that I learned in 78. We have to reconcile it. The third one was MIDI. 1982, I established the electronic lab at the University of Singapore. And uh, very soon, I realized that MIDI could not serve what I had in my mind. All it could serve was to amass sound and put it together, but it could not uh, navigate pitch differences. So we end up, you know, having to justify what we have to do. Uh, the national news reported it, so I will just play you. The Centre of Electronic Music Lab has been working on a format over a number of years and has now perfected it. Uh, sorry, it's not perfected. Pieces translate the program into real sound. They are linked to 18 generators which are capable of producing 64 different sounds. The concert, which will be presented as part of the music festival, is called Synthicom, because of the synthesizers and computers involved. The sounds that we get from any source can be put digitally into the tone generators and then used by our computers. So this technology will allow limitless avenue. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think uh, Asia has to reconcile itself Sorry, did the share go? Is it still sharing? Yes, but just not full screen. Maybe um, play from current slide. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, this is a major uh, uh, research I did uh, looking into the work of Jose Maceda. The, all, all these three names I'm going to mention are pivotal to musicology in Southeast Asia. So it's Professor Jose Maceda. I'm so honored. I, I'm one of his students. Uh, Yap Kunz, who is the legend in Indonesia, and Tran Van Ke, who is uh, the main uh, uh, font for musicology in Vietnam, all have passed on. But I hope to push their work forward to make people have some kind of ability to get skilled. In, you can see the array. You see, on top, you have the Western music scale. And then below that, almost every country is different. And we are pitch migrating to the West, and that has to be arrested now. So far, I've treated it as, all right, if the governments do not want it, it's fine. But I think from now on, I'm going to push it quite deliberately, right? because the, the, the music of this part of the world has to be saved. Now, this is my study of Western music. I have 5,000 records of this, and uh, it's all digitized now. But here, so, sorry, here, Joe, we lost the full screen. Maybe you could just uh, play from current slide again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, this is the kind of problem I am I faced uh, with uh, trying to use share. Uh, now, if you can see somewhere here, you've got the major triad that occurred. Uh, the, the, the early part of Western music was when there were chants and they were all in natural tones. Uh, they were they, there was no such thing as a pitch center. Every region in Europe had different uh, pitch levels, pitch intervals, but the chants were were pretty uh, clear where they came from uh, and which which part of Europe. Until Pope Gregory came around the fifth century, and then he decided that the church should have uh, one chant, and that created a big run for quite a few centuries. And in the process, they discovered something that uh, would create the triad, but not yet. There was a missing comma. And then for another two centuries, they tried looking for the missing comma. And finally, I would say tonality came about in the middle of the Baroque period. So you can see how long this took. Southeast Asia must put in the effort uh, to to uh, find a way to bridge our knowledge of the, the different intervals. Now, Argentina, there's one university there, UNTREF, that has for the last 25 years done their own work. The first thing they did was look here, let's get the, uh, the period from the, when the Spanish came and move backwards, not forwards, and dig the country up. So in other words, archaeology and all the allied uh, uh, ologies, uh, including musicology, came together. And whatever they found was scientifically recreated in terms of instruments and uh, other things related to them and put into a structure. And they performed. You, know, you can't see the whole orchestra, but uh, they, they call it orchestration but they, their performance was based on the concepts that they discovered from the graves and from underground and so forth, you see? Now, that's one method I respect. So let me go back to this. Uh, I will, I'll skip this because it's maybe... Uh, let me see. So you can see that they are incorporating many concepts. So what I did, because I'm trying to keep all this within 10 minutes as we agree, see, but uh, in this subject on pitch and pitch intervals and pitch uh, 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 intervals and pitch hierarchies. So if you change the pitch and so on, your whole listening uh, concepts have to change and adapt. So what I did was I created a measuring system 
and called it Sonic Orders Listening Mode Index. It's based on the very uh, mundane uh, elements, pitch, rhythm, form, timber, aesthetics. It's a piece of software created on a spreadsheet, so it doesn't cost anything. But when you attempt to put the what you listen and try to quantize it into numbers, you begin to get an understanding of how different people would uh, listen to the same thing and quantize it differently. And you get graphs and so forth, you see. And then the other part of the software deals with trying to quantize uh, actual transmissions in a country like Singapore. It can be done anywhere in the world, and that's what's happening now in slow stages. Uh, and that would give you the ability to see what is actually emitting through the emitters, radio, television, performances, recordings, and now the internet as well. Now, in Singapore, I, di I discovered that Western music is the, the, the bulk. It's, it's actually nine, almost 95%. And in my calculations, uh, I found that there's a trajectory uh, that where Western music is used as the vehicle. So I call it onloading. And there's also possibilities that Western music or any other form of music combines with others on an equal footing or some less than equal footing, but the vehicle need not be Western. So these are the things that excited me. And I began to uh, quantize Singapore in terms of what was there and in terms of modeling it. So I created a model. This is a construct model because after putting all the disciplines that said things about Singapore, social history, political history, economic history, and so on, I said, okay, the, the thing is to give this as the target model and then do the collection of the emissions of and analyze it. And this is what I got, Western music. See, earlier I said 40%, but now it's 70. In fact, it's higher now. Huh? This is not the latest assessment. Chinese music is way, way low. And Indian music is higher. Why? There are reasons for it. World music is about non-existent, although it talks so much. Now, I'm lucky that I was given a, a part-time job uh, uh, as a to teach a course, an uh, elective course at Singapore Management University. And that course, you know, was always oversubscribed. And uh, when the university moved to the city, they told me that here yeah, there's a space where you can build something for this course because they knew I had put in a last minute design in my PhD uh, where I drew something like this. And this is an actual laboratory that was built, which I used for eight years and collected a lot of data, which is now being used for this timeline music annotation system. Now, the problem was that the space they gave me was this black dot, which you see, it was a pillar. So obviously no one wanted the, the, lab, the, the, the spot in the campus, the new campus in city. So what we did, there are three of us, you know, I've got an audio engineer and a computer expert that we all work together. It was a very simple solution, which even architects uh, were surprised. So I said, okay, look here, at some point, I would like to have all my facilities here to, to teach and so on and record and so forth. And I would like to stand somewhere here and I think my class will be here. And here will be a, a data collection room, which was taboo at that time when I put put the, 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 the design out for, for implementation. So I said, if I was standing here and I wanted to teach a class or conduct a music uh, ensemble, I would obviously look at this pillar and say, put the door there. And this amazed the architects, you know, because they did, they did not think this way. So I said, anyway, there is hope for music anyway. Yeah? But the biggest... Well yeah. Would it be possible to uh, wind up in a one or two minutes, please? Yeah, yeah, two minutes should be okay. This server room was a point of contention because the IT people, I was in IT at the time in the US, always wanted to put servers to protect servers 
into a farm and they hide it away. But I insisted I needed to have it within the land and I gave them all the technical requirements and so on. They agreed. So that means there's an opening for design in all universities because I can help you get, get that through. The, now today, this is what it's all about, right? You, this app, uh, which is available anywhere, huh? uh, you just have to Google for it, Audio Timeliner, but it's a brilliant app. Its history goes back to Library of Congress and 12 universities uh, that developed apps and finally Indiana getting it and they came up with audio, uh, audio uh, variations audio. But uh, there were some problems, the engineers left and uh, one of them came up with the most simple, simplified app. Now I configure that physical lab now within servers and that is where we have this kind of a system where this app now you write to the sound and then the technology protects you, protects your sound and so on. So in other words, you go down to a classroom and server and you do your work there. Now that's what I had to work with on the issue of pitch and musical systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, maybe if there's an opportunity, you can share the link to the, the app and, and um, we can all access it and play around with it and learn from it as well. Sure. Um, and I think you've raised a few interesting and important um, points about, you know, the whole diversity of musical tuning systems around the world. Um, although I'm wondering whether understanding the timeline as a progression, you know, of uh, something leading to something um, in a linear narrative isn't uh, is, isn't the only way, um, uh, and and maybe that is a good point to bring in our second speaker, Dr. Rose Housewat, uh, and she will be amongst um, uh, other things talking about maybe living with two or three different tuning systems in her head and in her ears in Thailand. So over to you. Uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, I meant to introduce you properly. Um, <laughs> Dr. Hao Suat was born in Bangkok, Thailand and received a Bachelor of Fine and Applied Arts in Thai Traditional Music Performance from uh, Chulalongkorn University. And she was a Fulbright Fellow pursuing her graduate studies at the University of Washington, Seattle, where she received a PhD in Ethnomusicology in 2005. And upon her graduation, she joined the Faculty of Fine and Applied Arts uh, at Chula. And currently, she's an associate prof uh, of Thai traditional music at Chula. Okay, now properly your platform. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Sherry. Um, and now the storm at my house has stopped. It's quiet now. Um, a little, I was really worried. Um, I became really sensitive to the sound of the rain and storm recently. I, I actually have to say that I never pay attention to it, but the storm had become really strong and I think maybe I listen to things more critical, um, critically, even the rain, um, the wind. Uh, I would like to share a screen and um, just one slide before I move forward to share um, four more video clips. Um, thank you, Joe, for really um, a very um, informative uh, um, presentation, especially drawing my, drawing my attention to uh, the scales in Southeast Asia. Um, before I get into uh, the tuning system or talking maybe just the terminologies in Thai tuning system, I, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to um, Kun Kru Bruce Gaston. The word Kru means teacher in Thailand. And um, Kun Kru Bruce Gaston, he's a he is, he's an American uh, jazz pianist, um, top world ranking. Um, he moved to Thailand in 1979. And since then, he never moved back to America. And then he studied Thai traditional music with um, one of the most um, exciting and exuberant uh, Renat A player, Kun Kru Bun Yong Gek Kong. Um, Ajahn Bruce Gaston standing playing uh, in this photo, um, he's standing and he's playing uh, a keyboard with against, I use two terms, 
towards with and against um, a Thai be part on song. Oh, you see the xylophone, Renat a high pitch <clears throat> xylophone, and Renatu um, on the right, be nai oboe, and then Kong Wong Lik. Um, another Thai musician saxophone player standing. Um, that is one of the distinction, standing and sitting. Um, as standing and playing uh, instrument is the manner that we, a Thai traditional musician, perceive that it is something Western. And these Thai musicians continue to sit. I, I saw this photo and then I assumed that the xylophone must be tuned to the Western scale. Um, this is the right timing to, for me to, if talking about tuning system, I'm just a baby. There are great scholars in Thai um, traditional music who spend and dedicated their time on tuning system. For example, John Gasoli, um, the city is Wang Ibu Hong, and Zhang uh, Wu Chui, so what? Uh, but what I said that it is a good timing to, to, for me to start talking and thinking more deeply about tuning system. It just coincided at Tambrut Gaston just passed away on October 17 this year. So just about two weeks. Um, at Tambrut Gaston, in the, in, in the history of Thai music, we could say that he is probably one of the pioneering um, musicians who are trying to combine blended uh, Western and Thai musical instruments into uh, an ensemble. Even though before his time, uh, there, there are Thai composer who are trying to adapt it or borrow or adopt it, uh, a Western musical instruments into uh, a Thai ensemble, but uh, the real struggling is that it's in between uh, these two scales, between the Western scale and also between the Thai scale. Um, I, I myself started piano lessons, be and then before I quit piano lessons, I, I was introduced to Thai traditional music of central Thailand, and I decided to to study and major in Thai traditional music performance. And then after Jean Bruce Gaston, um, there are also, I would like to mention a few names, Ajang Warayot Suk Sai Shun, who's also developed uh, a theory of Thai music systems. And Ajang Warayot Suk Sai Shun is a fiddler. He's a Thai um, string instrument person. Why I mentioned string? Within the Thai system, it is not just about heptatonic, it is not just about equidistant, and it is still a myth to several of us in Thailand. Where does this term coming from? The myth of equidistant in Thai tuning, is it really equidistant? Um, within Thai music, there are string, there are si sound system for Thai string instrument, and uh, a sound system for B part, and a, Thai, a, a tuning system for those singers' vocal. So there are these two subcultures or in within the Thai world of tuning systems. Um, is it really um, equidistant? I invite those that um, would like to question this and, and find out more how it becomes a popularized term in, in Thai. In, in Thailand, it is belief, it's also a belief that it is equidistant. Um, Ajang Waro Yosuk Saishun introduced another system of um, that that he, he proposed that it is not equidistant in order to play all the tune and the systems. And um, later, there's a person whose his name is Hua Su Tui La. Um, the struggling between um, Thai tuning system and Western tuning system, 
um, when when we would like to to play and combine uh, musical instruments together from Western and Thai music, Wasu Tuila was the first person who um, built music a Thai musical instrument, a shape the name remained Thai, but just tuning them to all chromatic scales. But it just disappeared. It doesn't go anywhere because um, when you introduce a new system, um, a, a new a new style, um, the way you play it, it is assumed that, oh, just use the same technique when you play a chromatic scale, but it doesn't work because a chromatic scale, you, you can harmonize, you can play a chord, you can play a peggio, which is not familiar to a Thai musician. I would like to show you a clip. It, it would, the first video clip, it is, a, you will see a plug sitter. It is called Jake in Thai. Um, the first one will be played in Thai tuning system. Um, in a tune, in a tune called Kang Kao Kin let, let, let's hear the first piece together and then I will continue to discuss. Next video clip is on the same type of musical instrument and it's going to be the same tune, but with a chromatic scale on a jacquet. And you will see that a player doesn't use a plectrum anymore. He created uh, a performance technique for a jacquet with chromatic scale. Please play the second clip. The second clip and the first clip, they are exactly the same tuning. Um, there are four sections within Kang Kao Gin Gluai or translated, it is bats eating bananas. Um, the, 
So you can see that he gave up a plectrum. He does a strumming, and then on the rep, on the left hand side, when he pressed the frets um, with the first clips, you see that just the three fingers only index middle fingers, and then the ring fingers are used to press the string. Um, the thumb finger are just occasionally pressed on the brass string, just occasionally for embellishment. Then you see that he began to introduce to use the thumb um, in order to press the chords or three, three, three notes at the same time in order to harmonize um, the melodies of the bats eating bananas by himself. The third clip, now, I'm sure you know the tunes. to show that with this jacquet chromatic and with this person he's able to play a classical piece the next one a popular tune for a Thai instrument you will never play an accompanying yourself like singing and then playing at the same time like a guitar person playing and singing then you see the next clip on the fourth one and it will be a last clip please To, what I want to achieve by showing these four clips is just to say that from my just baby perspective who just enter to think deeply about tuning system is that tuning system is not just about sound but it's, it's about cultural context that's surrounding the way we play music is surrounding the feelings that we feel about music is surrounding the heart of the musicians, the owner of the culture. Um, what does it mean when we give up the Thai tuning system, but the body of the instrument are still Thai and with the name that is still Thai? I would just to end my um, discussion right here, and then we could um, pass on to the next speaker. And um, if there is questions or the second round, I can share more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hauswat. Um, I think it's so important to show that there are hierarchies within hierarchies and one system doesn't necessarily replace the other and that uh, they co-adapt. But obviously there are, there are lots of interesting power relationships in terms of who has more choice to make particular decisions. And on this front, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Khayam Alami, who um, has been working on the software side of things and developing um, various electronic formats um, that can be you know, applied very easily by people like me who are complete Luddites. Um, and, and these uh, you know, different interfaces, electronic interfaces um, can hopefully allow um, people to rethink and recalibrate um, completely, diff completely different tuning systems um, without having to think about a particular template, whether it is Western diatonicism or a Thai 
equiheptatonic and non-equiheptatonic system or um, microtonal systems in the Middle East or in, or in India and so on and so forth. So Khayyam was born in Damascus in 1981 and is an Iraqi-British multi-instrumentalist musician, composer, researcher, and founder of Nawa Recordings, primarily a performer of the Oud, his artistic research focuses on the development of contemporary and experimental repertoire based on the fundamentals of Arabic music with a focus on tuning and microtonality. He holds a BA and master's in ethnomusicology from SOAS, University of London, and is currently completing an M4C HRC funded PhD in composition at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, Birmingham City University. So over to you, Khayam. Thank you very much, he, um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Peters and Dr. Prosawat, for your um, uh, interventions earlier. Um, before I, I share my screen and, and share a couple of uh, things, I just want to pick up on this very clear political dimension of this subject. And um, th th this was a dimension that I particularly tried to focus on when uh, we launched the Apotome project in collaboration with Counterpoint Studio at CTF Festival in January this year, because I felt that the this is something that isn't really being talked about um, in much detail. We we especially in this last year, eighteen months, we've heard so much about decolonizing everything um, in, in many shapes and forms. But what has always been of interest for me is trying to dig deep into the absolute root causes and fundamentals of things. And just like uh, Dr. Fosavad mentioned just now, that this idea of um, lo maintain, losing a tuning system, but maintaining the body of an instrument, for example, and uh, developing a new way of performing and trying to adapt the instruments to be able to perform different kinds of music, I think is really formidable and it's and is really necessary. But at the same time, there's something about it that makes me feel like we are, um, because of the conditioning uh, for of the last 30, 40 years, the musical conditioning that uh, ears of audiences and musicians have been subjected to because of the homogeny of 12-tone equal temperament, w we've lost somehow this connection with, with, a, with a certain type of DNA, let's say, for want of a better word, that, that is related to musical cultures. And I am not a preservationist or a traditionalist in any sense of the word. I do believe in trying to learn from the past in order to be able to move forward in a meaningful way. But I like to learn rules in order to be able to break them. And the, the one thing that I've come across consistently when researching this subject is the lack of accessibility of this information, the lack of accessibility of ways to interact with this DNA that is meaningful by today's standards. I think that, I mean, particularly across the Middle East, and I won't speak for uh, any Southeast Asian cultures because I don't have that lived experience, but in the Middle East, for example, there's a, a, such a strong nostalgia for that period of the 50s, 60s, um, early to mid 70s, when there was this drive of creativity and, and exploration in the um, a sonic world and somehow everything today seems to refer back to that rather than trying to think about where we're at today what kind of sounds and genres and uh, uh, feelings that audiences are interested in listening to particularly when we're thinking about the younger generations and this is why i i try to create these tools in a way that was not only accessible in that they run in the web browser and that they're free, but also by creating elements of them that allow us to experiment with this information and try to think about creative freedom rather than thinking about somehow representing the past. And, and, and I, I mean that in, in, in the real sense of the word, to represent it in a new way. Um, and this is, you know, I've had some pushback about this from some people who for example, assume that this whole project is about trying to um, give agency to traditional musicians and to be able to play traditional musics and ethnic musics and folk musics using modern tools. And, and this was never my intention. It was always about trying to make this element of this musical 
personal, individual, cultural DNA available and accessible so that we could actually find a freedom to explore things in, in any way that we wanted rather than having to um, rehash the past and represent it in a different way because ultimately nothing is pure in any culture everything is about cross-pollination and it's about interactions and the desire that musicians had you know earlier in the century last century when there was all of these uh, developments of recording technologies and then obviously musical uh, technologies particularly the digital ones we saw that the photo that Dr. Fosavad was uh, sharing at the beginning was uh, 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 of a uh, Yamaha DX7 synthesizer. This was one of the first, the first commercially available FM synthesizer that actually allowed also for microtuning. So um, it's no wonder that that was being used there. Uh, Arab musicians, for example, used the Farfisa organ that was made in Italy, which allowed for, it was an analog uh, synthesizer that replicated the organ, but it allowed for the, the actual tuning of e each of the individual individual chromatic notes um, in an octave repeating fashion. So you can see that there was that desire and that drive, but then as these digital, at these, as these musical tools became more um, uh, uh, mass manufactured, the hegemony and uh, of, of equal temperament just took over because of its convenience. And I often refer to 12 ton equal temperament really as the McDonald's of tuning because it, for me, it feels very much like that. It's fast and it's convenient, it's quick, but it really has very little nutritional value <laughs> in a musical sense. Even on a European level, you know, it's not. Uh, there's a is a fabrication, and there's a myth that Western music is all based on equal temperament, and it really isn't. It never really was in practice. It's a theoretical construct that was never accurately reproduced until digital tools became the mainstream, and that's where we find ourselves at today. But I don't think that the way out of it is to try and rehash the past and represent that in a way. I think it's about trying to use the past and that information of history, but to try and move forward and, and create something that's meaningful for us. So with that in mind, I'm just going to very quickly share um, uh, my screen and um, a little example of how some of these things work. When we were um, preparing to um, launched the Apotome project, we, uh, uh, myself and uh, the organizers of CTM Festival in Berlin, we uh, commissioned a few musicians to create new works uh, filmed in their own studios using um, Lima and Apotome, the two tools that um, I designed with uh, uh, Counterpoint. And um, Harsia Wahono, musician from Indonesia, got in touch with me and said, there's this video of a, a slum pret player, which is this um, uh, uh, wind instrument, double reed uh, instrument. And he said to me, is there any way you can extract this, uh, analyze this tuning data for me so that I can use it in my presentation? So I'm going to show you a quick clip of the um, instrument performance itself and then how um, I uh, analyze that data and, and what is possible then. So that's the clip of the performance. So I extracted the audio and I loaded it in a software. Um, it's a commercially available software. Unfortunately, it's not free. It's called uh, Melodyne. And here you can see the, the musical performance. Um, it's always much easier to do this kind of analysis with uh, solo uh, recordings. Uh, you, you can you know, get somewhere with multiple instruments playing at the same time, but it's usually easier with a solo recording. So here, I'll just play it again. And you can hear that it's the same audio. Very quickly, I was able to do an analysis and pull out this tuning information that you can see here on the left. And this is the value of the different notes in sense, the different notes that are being played. Going through the entire recording, you can very quickly pick out all of the main notes, see where the um, ornaments are, etc., and then get some element of that data. What's important to remember here 
is that this is really representative of this recording of this performer performing on that particular instrument. And what's interesting for me about thinking of this in this way is that we bring back the idea of the individuality of the performers not only a generalization about musical culture because it would be very easy for me for example to represent this as being um, uh, or, or present this information as being representative of a musical culture from a specific geographic location but the reality is that it very much um, as much as it might be similar to uh, other musicians who perform of this in the same musical culture, this is also very rel relative to that particular recording and that particular instrument and that particular performer's way of playing. So once um, we have this uh, tuning information here, and you can see there's a lot of numbers, but what we're mostly interested in are the ones that have these scale degrees, and that, that's, that's something that I did. It's not automated in the uh, software. And so we can see the different uh, pitch classes, the different notes that are being used on this instrument. So by taking this data, I very quickly um, typed it into so first thing in uh, in Lima we figure out what the fundamental uh, reference pitch is um, which uh, sorry you can't hear at the moment because it's mapped in a different way but I'll play it to you in a second and then here are the different values um, of that tuning as per the analysis and then when we go to this next page we can map that tuning uh, as a subset that we can play. And I have this now routed so that I can play it with my um, uh, MIDI keyboard. And so um, I think I, yeah, um, it's going through my MIDI keyboard into Ableton Live. And so here, if I turn on the synthesizer, Immediately, we can tell that it's exactly the same sound. Uh, not only, sorry, not exactly the same sound. It's exactly the same tuning. And the beauty here now is that the sound can be manipulated. And no, we're no longer now relying on that audio as a sample, for example, if we want to try and create something new or if we want to l learn some more about that um, uh, musical uh, culture, we can actually learn how to play that melody on a completely different instrument, on a keyboard instrument. And there's no need to make this correlation between, you know, the 12 tone keyboard and the piano and uh, uh, 12 tone equal temperament because ultimately it's just a mechanical device. So um, again, uh, now that 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 musical DNA is available in Lima, then you can jump through using different synthesizers. This is uh, something uh, synthesizer called uh, Pigments by Arturia. <laughs> very easy you can also jump and use different samples so this is something that will give us a slightly different sound and it's very easy to just jump through different kinds of sounds and then change ranges and uh, figure out multiple different ways of exploring that um, musical information. And if we listen now, for example, in equal temperament, uh, sorry, the octave is very low. If I was just to try to play this on a normal synthesizer, this is what I would get. Whereas with the tuning that's routed through Lima, it's much easier. And so these kinds of um, uh, ways of exploring I think are, are interesting because it allows us not only to um, think about uh, exploring the musical, the, the sonic uh, framework in a different way, but it also allows us to explore the musical framework in a different way and think about how to create a new music, you know, in, in rather than trying to represent 
uh, traditional cultures or represent Western music in the way that it's done, this is something that can, this, this way of thinking at least about making music can allow us to create something new out of this hybridity, which we're never going to be able to get rid of. You know, there's, there's no way that we can completely disassociate ourselves from Western music or Indian music or African music or whatever musical culture. These things are there, they're present, they're part of our day-to-day -day lives. And I think we just need to try and embrace them in a way without losing that individuality, without losing that, that, that uh, sense of self in a way or a sense of culture that makes us who we are ultimately. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's always really been about creative exploration and, and where this can go, because we need to start creating new futures rather than allowing the technologies and other uh, uh, logics to dictate our futures, because that's ultimately what's been happening for the last hundred years or more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khayam, for um, you know encouraging us to focus on what can be done instead of thinking about the losses of the past. Although I think the past has, um, in many ways, um, uh, released a lot of well, um, caused a lot of interesting um, musical traumas, as it were. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be very interested in your um, uh, your app, your apps. It would be great if you could share them um, with. Uh, the people who are listening, um, and also potentially um, Rose, I think people would also be interested in your sites, as well as I think Joe, who's already shared his. So I wanted to pick up a few points across all three of your presentations, and myself being someone committed to decolonial initiatives and in musical listening and practice, um, there is a lot of defining against the West which I think as Khayam and, and also um, Joe and um, Rose pointed out, isn't a single monolithic thing. You know, even equal temperament hasn't always been assumed and AS440 was never really a universal standard until very recently. Um, and I think it's so important that this panel is a group of um, people of color talking to each other across continents, um, albeit using the <laughs> colonial, post-colonial really language of English and funded by the Goethe Institute. And I think that's maybe an interesting starting point in terms of the political um, affordances that have come with these sorts of projects about, let's say, tuning systems, right? Uh, how, how can we um, look at, um, you know, to, to quote Maja Hood, who writes about musical terror versus musical invasives, how can we think about maintaining agency and decisions, musical decisions amidst a lot of, you know, political um, pressure that has affected itself on like whatever uh, technology is available out there realistically for, let's say, a school to use. And I think Joe's and Khayam's um, platforms uh, are, are really, really instrumental um, in, in being a, to give, giving, giving us the opportunity to start um, not only looking at the past again, but looking forward. But then maybe even thinking of history as moving um, in one timeline as a, a B happens after A and C happens after B isn't necessarily useful. As Rose has pointed out, you know, we, we are all working with overlapped and intersectional ways of listening and thinking. So um, one big question I have for everyone is, you know, amidst all of these overlapping dialogues, and you can see that in Joe's graphs um, and the examples that um, Rose has shared with us and then looking forward into the future, there is still a sense that we are stuck. We are still stuck in the um, machinations of diatonicism. Uh, I mean, bearing in mind that, you know, Joe's project ended in 2003 and Alexander Ellis published his first, you know, important work in 1886. So have things changed? Um, do any, I mean, realistically, you know, there's been lots of publications, Maja Hood, John Garzoli, uh, and many other, you know, Chinese philosophers, but have things changed in the last 150 years? What things exactly? <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking me or would you like to suggest things? Okay, the way we listen, um, uh, I have to admit, I, I had spent um, two years trying to learn the Tai So Duang and I still cannot um, get out of the diatonic framing. Uh, 
although I'm quite happy doing uh, slides and microtones, and maybe that's because of my cultural upbringing, listening to some um, Chinese orchestral music, which is already itself kind of manipulated. But yeah, it's difficult to, yeah. You can't, you can't change. Changed. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Peter. Uh, you, you can't change anything, you know, in a jiffy. Uh, it takes a long process, and you are seeing change now, and it is really being dri driven by participation. Now, in the in the world of music, I've been saying this for fifty years. Uh, the academic world has disregarded the participation of the music chain, and that is where it's driven. And uh, Kayam, you are doing productions relating to that or what accrued from that given the academic world do you think uh, of either France where all the computer musicians I worked with the computer musicians in, in, in Italy to know that I could not transfer that to Singapore because it's mathematical you see so so uh, when MIDI came I was the first one in fact I got the first computer from Yamaha they came to my office to present me, and eventually it was called by top uh, university people, Joe and his toys, when I created all this. But I was after uh, some ability to modify the fixed 127 stops. Until today, there is not a single piece of research. But of course, I changed my mind now when I looked at your software. So I will follow up with you on a different different uh, area in my work. But there is this inability to know that it takes many lifetimes to change. And European history, because they recorded it so well, maybe they had nothing better to do. But it was recorded so well that we can study what the ups and downs were. And the way it was said, like for example, if Grout said that, Primitive music was where where they he placed it before uh, Europe began to even move into the face of the chant. Now that means the whole of the world, the ninety five percent are primitive to grout. So the moment I finished that book, I said I will not read him anymore. Although there's a lot of information there, so I went to others. Atali wrote a different version of it, which I accept. And in fact, I used, he said, every nation must be judged by their sound. You see, he was, and, and you have a few others also you know, who, 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 who wrote about a different approach to this, uh, the soundscape, so to speak. Now, it is up to the universities and the people in charge of music to, uh, to imbibe these issues. The people at the ground, they want immediate reactions. So you can see uh, TikTok is the way to go for the young people. Uh, I, I agree with you, Kayam. You are in the middle of this and you have to play to a market. And that market is not even trained by musicology. I would say even music education, because from what I've seen in all the papers that they write, it's uh, uh, people theorizing. And where there are methodologies, it becomes a publishing adventure to make money, you see. And I haven't seen, I, I would still say the MMCP synthesis, which was written in New York, is still the best system, see, but it hasn't made a buck. Thank you very much, Dr. Peters. I appreciate your encouragement very much, and I'd be more than delighted to work with you on anything. Um, I just want to pick up actually on one a small point that you're making, which is about ultimately, I think, about the accessibility of this information and and uh, th these these capabilities. And as much as I am really a fan of um, rigorous academic research, uh, I think you know trying to um, bring these ideas back into a uh, common consciousness is really what we need. And I don't think that that can happen unless we have more creative works, more artworks, more creative explorations that 
try some of this in order to, uh, uh, you know, bring, bring that back into our ears, both as listeners and as musicians. And, um, and ultimately, like she, you were asking about whether things have changed. And I think things have changed a lot, but ultimately, it's about how that change is represented, right? Here we're talking a lot about the re, that, that historicizing or the rehistoricizing of the past and who has had the agency to be able to speak about these subjects and who has had the place to be able to present alternative ideas and, and whether they're picked up on or not. One um, uh, comment I had about this project when we launched it was that, um, Khayyam, this is really great because we as Middle Eastern uh, people, we are just consumers and we don't create anything we don't make anything we just consume and it's great that you've created something and I, I i mean this is a compliment obviously but i i it made me very sad to think that this is the way that we see ourselves today as as consumers passive that we don't have the agency to create something to think differently to to critique things and to to try and find different ways to to move forward and, and i think the rate of change that we are seeing today is just incredible. And the kind of opportunities that the technological tools allow us are huge, but that requires a real critical mind because if we just accept what the technology represents us, then we see all of the zeros of equal temperament as being a default standard. And we think that equal temperament is the reference. You know, everything is zero. But, but in my view, for example, I think choice should be the reference. We shouldn't have a bunch of numbers being represented as the default. We should have a choice being represented as the default. And that completely changes everything, the way that we, we view information, the way that we interact with it. And, and sorry, just to add a very quick point, you mentioned Alexander Ellis earlier. Alexander Ellis was the uh, mathematician, English mathematician who created, developed the sense system. And this is a system for measuring the distances within an octave. So an octave is the doubling of a frequency. And he created the system that you could measure that octave by giving it a value of 1200 cents. What's really interesting about Alexander Ellis that most people do not know is that his work, well, this is clear information and, and well known, his work was uh, a translation of the German physicist Helmholtz's uh, book, Sensation of Tone, and the, the introduction of the sense system was in the appendixes, along with lots of other information about the history of equal temperament and different tunings from around the world, etc. But what is really curious is that if you look at Helmholtz's German original of the book, all of the tuning data that Helmholtz used was represented in ratios, which is the ancient way of doing things. In Alice's uh, translation, he removed all of the ratios and used sense exclusively. And this is really, really, for me, it was an incredibly poignant moment when I realized because well, who would think to like look back at the German original of Ellis? Everybody's relying on the English translation that Ellis made and all of his work. But if you look back at the German, you just see immediately that there's a completely different worldview. There's a completely different way of representing the information. By using ratios, he's maintaining, uh, by Helmholtz using ratios, he's maintaining this link with the past, but looking forward as you know, how can we re-interrogate uh, this information and, and uh, deal with it in different ways? Whereas Ellis comes along is just like, okay, this is my new system. This is the, the, the way that we need to be able to do this because it allows us to compare it to equal temperament and this theory, uh, the theoretical framework of the piano and Western music and therefore applies it to everything. And now everybody's using sense when they are actually inaccurate as well. So uh, I just wanted to point that out because I think this historicizing and re-historicizing is equally important in this scenario. Well, great. I just, yeah. just one single point because I told Maya I'll bring this up. You see, uh, the, the fact that Goethe is staging this conversation and I hope it will go on uh, because ethnomusicology was created out of the clash between German, Germany and USA. See, uh, if Germany carried on what they were doing, I don't think we probably wouldn't even have the MIDI that we have today. So I'm, I'm theorizing here, but I paid special attention to that. I hope this message will go to Goethe because in the current era, if you do more of this in specialized sessions, uh, I think Asia will benefit because in Asia, I found the young people 
are listening. You see, I couldn't get young people to listen when I talked about uh, uh, yeah, even technology introduction because to them the technology is accessible. They could even go through the technology while I'm giving them a lecture. But when it came to the COVID-19, and I, they were in their homes and some were in their toilets and I was in my house, I realized that I can use a different system. See, So even if they were not in the classroom, they still had something to do, so to speak, and it served outside. Uh, I will carry on with this. See? But the fact that Germany actually defended its spot and, and, and it's there in the literature. So I hope in your PhD, you will read up that part where ethnomusicology was created. And let's evaluate ethnomusicology once again. Because I, I think, think ethnomusicology is um, right now being uh, evaluated from especially decolonial views. And, you know, back to the fact that this is a, a panel that's sponsored by the Goethe Institute, conducted in English, really talks about the hegemonies that are at play. Um, and rather than thinking about whether it was Alexander Ellis who came up with a sense system, which is so that, you know, everything is based on a log function, as John Garzoli points out, as opposed to ratios, which makes the calculation sometimes a hard, harder for the the lay person to understand. What about the decolonial perspective? Maybe we don't need um, German musicologists or ethnos to tell us what our tuning systems are uh, or, or British to translate the German version, right? And I think um, Kayam can speak a lot about Middle Eastern approaches and treatises that are taken for granted. But what is happening in Southeast Asia? And sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> Rose, but what is, I, I can have an inkling of what you might say, but over to you. What is the Southeast Asian pronouncement today in the 21st century in October 30th, 2021? Me, right? Yes. Uh, Rose or Joe? No, no. Rose. Rose. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, uh, I, I, well, when, when three of you speaking about Ellis and, um, I don't know if you know about uh, atmosphere and um, the impact of um, Ellis' statement in um, in Thailand, especially in Thai traditional music. I never thought about this, but I think it's almost like we we colonized ourselves or crypto crypto colonized ourselves by Ellis' statement. We adopted it immediately. That okay, even even um, this is very hard for me to say because it's all a lot of about a power play. Um, I would, I'll try to. It's very it's very difficult to question, um, even in a theory class of type music in a university. Okay. Um, I see Joe's nodding your head. Is but well, I understand Thailand. See, yeah, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so once Ellis' statement has been published, it was handed down. And it's not just handed down, but it's safeguarding. And it's become a belief. So it's when it becomes a belief, then it is difficult for younger generation or younger scholar or new generation to um, propose a research project just to question or to measure a Thai tuning system. And that's why, and that's why um, this territory has been left alone for a long time. Um, a, a clip that I have shown it to you is, um, is another example of uh, uh, the way that um, a younger generation has trying to move forward and um, sometimes sometime as a situation like this, a belief like this, it block them, it block their imagination, it block their uh, imagination to explore, to experiment um, and to achieve the horizon of beauty more to come. We, I think we have been locked inside ourselves for too long. And this is the reason why I, I chose to play these four video clips. Um, and this and th this is the reason why I start uh, a discussion today 
with a tribute to Ajahn Bruce Gaston, who was one of the very first person who um, struggling in between. And I, I was able to, and I, I was brave enough to ask the questions to one of the, his band, Fong Nam's member, two weeks ago. Brother, do you really tune the Ranat A and the Ranatum to Western scale? Me, I kept these questions for a long time. For a really long time, 32 years, I have been listening to the recordings. I've been a big fan. I think I have um, become senior enough to ask the questions and have a good, good relationship to really ask this simple question and just to hear that, yes, we tune it. And that's it. Thank you for that really powerful sharing, which you know goes back to the question of very intersectional issues. That it's not just the West versus the non-West, and you know the word non-Western is actually banned at my university because we're talking about a huge, like the ninety-five percent that Joe talks about. But I'd like to just go back to Hayam's point that it's not necessarily about you know reclaiming a past that was lost, but rather about choice and the opportunity to make choice agency who has a decision-making power. And um, I mean, my commitment to decolonial work is that, you know, as a post-colonial person, uh, if I want to do decolonial work, do I just give up Beethoven and Bach? No, that, that was part of my upbringing, just that I suspect for a lot of young Thai people, the diatonic system, alongside many different kinds of Thai systems, are part of the texture and the language, and we um, struggle to find a balance in embracing all of this. Um, and ultimately, the decisions that we make uh, are as much a part of our own agency, as well as what is available and what is polit politically deemed uh, appropriate or politically deemed, you know, acceptable. So the situation in Singapore is going to be very different from in Thailand or in Bali, um, as Made Hood has written about, or, um, you know, in in, in um uh, other parts of the Philippines and Indonesia, Indonesia and so on and so forth. And yeah, I, I guess um, a question to all of us um, will be, how do we juggle different sides of our um, scholarly and practicing selves as people who are looking forward? Bearing in mind that I am not a huge fan of, you know, thinking of progressive histories as if the past was very primitive, uh, to use Joe's word, um, and the future is the only way forward. Um, so, so yeah, how do we how do we find a balance, and how do we get how how do we gain ground to even make decisions or or get onto the table where we can have decision-making power over our own lives and the way we listen. I mean, I have some thoughts and I think two of them are, are already being suggested as proactive things today in the software, but over to anyone. Uh, what I've suggested is time scale development. So very much like other in the academia, at least uh, those who are in charge of uh, training because you're 95% needs to be trained uh, as opposed to, you know, needs to enjoy uh, that kind of thing. So the, the school systems and the universities have to sit down. For each country, it will be a different pres prescription. It will be a different kind of policy and a different kind of funding. But you need to assess it. And you cannot use the tools that you get uh, from the current tools. I've been following our also UN-based uh, 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 evaluation group and I went to Taiwan to present the macro measure but I was the only one and that was years ago until today there's no macro measure you can you can learn a curriculum and test the student and give the grade you see but you need to have the overall tracking and that's missing in music uh, especially in music ed so that is one way I, I, the other the other way is for individuals and universities and radios and all that to track. Today I, I track what, what what the radios are tracking for either live or in the it, it's all about uh, rates ratings. You see, so it's it's cool. There is a vacuum for 
musicians, professional musicians, uh, once in, uh, in power, uh, like Ross, uh, uh, to, to bring it out in a, what we call a diplomatic way, to get it approved and checked over so many semesters or so many academic years and keep that cycle going. There is no uh, example of which, which I can tell you now. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to jump in quickly uh, to pick up on both of your points, actually. Dr. Fosavadi, thank you so much for that um, for that uh, interjection a, a moment ago. It was really powerful for me because you mentioned the idea of imagination and, and the lack of space for imagination. And this is something that uh, has become clearer and clearer to me over the last few years working on this project, that there really is a crisis of imagination across the board, not only in cultures that have you know been uh, dealt this hegemonic uh, um, uh, whatever uh, umbrella um, but even even in Europe and America uh, there's a, an online magazine called Pitchfork that did an article about this project and when they were sharing the article on their Facebook page the amount of comments that were incredibly you know uh, uh, degrading and, and problematic for me just proved this point that there is really a crisis of imagination because we've come to accept so much as being uh, uh, you know sacrosanct everything all this there's so much knowledge that we have inherited that we just do not question in any shape or form and as much as i think that th these kind of changes need to happen on an institutional level whether that be governmental or uh, educational etc young people today are not going to wait for those kind of changes to be uh, uh, actually you know enacted in uh, legislation and then you know presented through university research programs etc etc they're going to deal with whatever they have at their disposal and the more and more I see, uh, uh, look around me, the more and more I realize that we just need to capture people's imagination with an idea, with a different kind of possibility, and then allow them the space to be able to run with that and do whatever that they want. You know, it's, I think it's ultimately, I, I put my artist's hat on now instead of the academic hat, and I would say this needs to be about inspiration. It needs to be about imagination. It needs to be about play and exploration, I think, rather than trying to impose this uh, very uh, uh, scientific and historical and political uh, th thing only. You know, th there needs to be some magic there. I've got a, a naughty thought here, um, and, and that's got to do with, you know, your idea that really young people are not going to spend a lot of time um, looking to the past. And even if we're going to blame primary school teachers or give them the burden or responsibility as educators um, who try to fix things right from the start, maybe it's about the kinds of technologies that they're using today. And, you know, someone mentioned TikTok. And I, uh, I'm i going to point out that TikTok is actually owned by China, who is a major participant in the new global order. And, you know, people are talking about China as a different kind of colonial power today. So how does that work out? Um, uh, do, uh, Khayam, does your software work with TikTok? I mean, obviously, I think people can create things with it and then post it on, on TikTok. But how, um, looking forwards, uh, how, how do you think the scene might play out in different ways? And what are our roles yeah, I, I think I don't. Well, I don't think we can point a finger at anybody, to be honest, because I think everyone is implicit on all levels, right? Whether it be music producers, uh, manufacturers, uh, educators, uh, institutions, governments, you know, everybody's implicated. But um, I think the technological means are there. And, and once the inspiration happens, people will make those changes. The, the, the tools are there, so much of which is easily accessible and, and people will do it just as they, as they did in the past. And they'll adapt the, the tools to be able to suit whatever environments that they want. Obviously, something like TikTok is a major uh, corporation with a huge amount of you know uh, 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 um, uh, employees and workflows, etc. Whether they pick up on these kinds of ideas or not, you know, who knows? But ultimately, I don't think we should be waiting around for anybody to do it. I think we just need to take the bull by the horns and at least make these attempts and try to contextualize them 
uh, and and this was my goal at least. I didn't want to come out and just say, "Hey, I made this nice new software and this runs in the browser and it's free. You can use it. Thank you. Bye," because I know that the conversation is much more nuanced and and this political environment actually is key because this is what allows us to have that strength that Dr. Prosovad was mentioning earlier to actually go up and say, hey, I heard, you know, that this is a thing or, or, or an issue or this is a thing that exists and can we have a discussion about it? You know, why why is it that um, uh, even in the U.S. now you can get through to master's level education or through a conservatoire in, in Italy or in Germany, you know, 10, 10 years of study without ever having to confront the issue of intonation and tuning when it's absolute fundamental. And so I, I, I don't think that tuning itself is an important thing, but I think it's a really powerful key that unlocks all of these other related subject matters and allows us to look through its prism in a, in a really unique way. Yeah, just two points um, I thought to respond, which is, you know, I think our definition of technology can also be broadened. Um, the the jake is also another kind of technology that has been, as Rose has shown, adapted so very easily. Um, but it's really the thinking behind um, the technology and the different kinds of hegemonies that are at play, um, which also made me think about the hegemonic, that hegemony of obsession over tuning systems and calculating pitch and so on and so forth is, I don't know, is this going back to Helmholtz versus Ellis? Is this a necessarily, uh, uh, you know, as Graham care a lot about is, you know, atmosphere and texture, texture and timbre. And these are things that um, I, I think are equally, if not more important in Southeast Asia um, than tone structures, for example. And then other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, it might be, you know, uh, different kinds of rhythmic models um, and, yeah, um, rhythmic structures as the underpinning structure of um, uh, musical practice as opposed to a tone system and everyone knows the, the Western art music system is just completely obsessed with tonality. So, you know, maybe we can shift the, the conversation a little to, to explore why the obsession over tuning systems and why the um, uh, fear of dealing with that today um, to, uh, or maybe not fear, I, it's just that, you know, a lot of new articles that are being published in international journals actually don't talk about tuning system all that very much because maybe it's too geeky or maybe it's too mathematical or maybe it's too passé. Um, do people have any thoughts about this? And while people are speaking out here, I, I think we might be able to open some questions to the floor too. So please bring in your questions as people are debating um, beyond tuning. Yeah, Sherry, um, may I jump in and um, following your uh, suggestions? Um, is it, um, I, I, I would like to um, draw attention to the tuning system in Southeast Asia, in um, Indonesia, in Thailand. We share one commonality, which is that there are so, such a variety of uh, tuning system. It just depending, it's, it's not just one system. And it has never been standardized before. Um, the idea of standardization uh, or standardizing tuning system is also another, um, a modern thing, another um, idea that has been introducing to um, our house, I would say. Um, so in the past, the tuning system, it just depends on this teacher's house and that teacher's house. Um, um, what in I, I would speak and I share with you and, and share is your sentence is just echoes in my heart that in the past it is so glory but probably we we need to share more information um, to even to um, to the international or even to our own younger generations because they didn't know um, the singer from each house or each school. For example, in Bangkok in the past, they have um, the, the singing, uh, the pitch, they are not singing the same pitch. So um, a musician has to tune to a singer of the band. 
right? So that's the way um, it has been uh, a tuning system like that. So for example, Pattaya Gosun house has one tuning system. It's a little bit higher than another house or the school. So the variety of this tuning system has also um, become extinct. And I think um, we as a musicians, we at ethnomusicology, um, this tuning system is human intellectual property. If it's lost, it's gone. And um, another thing is that um, you have asked her e, why it has become um, such a thing, the tuning system. Plus, it become like a national heritage. It, the nationalism, nationalization of the country. So we have to find one tuning system that representing a country or a particular uh, musical genre in order to representing the country. So then uh, standardization come into play in this picture. Um, last that I would like to answer the question to myself, like why in the past, just the past two years, I became five years, I became um, interested more and more. How could I play? I'm a JK player. How could I play a JK with a guitarist player with a pianist, I'm struggling. And um, I was bending a string. It's impossible to ask a pianist to retune a piano to my decay. I was, um, I was, I was playing to a wider audience, a Thai audience who were, who were less familiar to a Thai tuning system who were less familiar to Thai traditional music repertoire. But they asked me to play a JK um, at an event, second event, third event. Um, I had to stop playing a JK and sat because the tuning is just off. And, and that's why I asked this person in a clip that, can I borrow your chromatic scale JK so that um, my JK wouldn't disappear from the scene, from the event. So it would come closer to a wider audience in Thai society. And then I can invite them to come into the circle of traditional music once they know that this body embody a tuning system that is not belonging to the original body. Um, I'm really interested in Kayam's application and I will dive into it. I will study so that maybe I can do something with it and introduce to my students and play with it um, with their imagination, creativities for future experimenting. Yeah. We have a question from John Garzoli, who yeah. asks if the, the word system is even the correct term because it has implications, you know, of, of maybe schema or, or set ways of doing things that may not be helpful. I don't know if people in this panel might suggest alternative terminologies instead of system. But tuning and intonation are the two words that are, made, are most often used. And I think those are the two most accurate. When we talk about a tuning system, we talk about one that has been systematized in some way. So um, whether it be the tuning of a, of a gamelan orchestra where the, the, the each particular pitch class is created by the maker of the gamelan orchestral instruments, the ensemble instruments based on the m main gong that is created at the beginning, etc. That's a systematization of something. It, I don't think that it necessarily um, uh, imposes a, a sense of standardization. And I think this is a connotation that comes with the word in much the same way that there's the connotation that the piano has to be tuned to equal temperament and cannot be tuned to anything else. I, I mean, I, I am personally, and, and I don't mean this to sound offensive in any way, I I am so tired of 
um, musicians such as Dr. Posavadi having to remove an element of themselves in order to make room for an instrument like the piano, when the piano itself is a mechanical instrument that needs to be tuned before a performance anyway. So why does it have to be tuned to equal temperament? Why can't it be tuned to something else? I mean, the effort has been made to ship it from England or Germany or America all the way over to all these other parts of the world. It's already there. It's already present. People are using it. There's no reason why it can't be malleable. But there is an association that it has to be this thing because that's what it represents. And I find this incredibly infuriating, to be honest with you. Sorry, I, there was two points in one. Yeah, well, Jeff Smith in Brighton, England, has created the fluid piano. I'm sure you, many of you have heard of it. So why don't you look at it? He, he tried so hard. He put his life savings into it. But uh, it's disregarded uh, for political reasons, I suppose. See? So uh, that's where you should, you should look at. Now, uh, Ross, you should go yeah. to Mahasarakam University and ask Dr. Tinakon. Uh, I discovered a whole bunch of videotapes. And then I looked through it and I digitized quite a few megabytes before I left uh, to show them that you can actually study the migration of Molam through those states. It's a lot. And many of them are in danger of going extinct. So these are the kind of things that if it happens in a music college, to me, it's quite serious. But uh, you can take, you can have a talk with them. And I, I would say that is an asset for love music, wherever it is in Isan. But pitch migration is very high. But there's a difference between masters stuck away in the far uh, rice fields who can still perform, who make their own instruments, and they have to be studied before you can say there's any lum music system. Mm, see? Interesting. Or Thank whatever. you. Yeah. It, I couldn't finish the digitization. Wow. But I hope somebody else would. You talk to Dr. Tinakon. There's so much material out there and, and, and the, the possibilities seem so endless in terms of what tools are available and the technologies, etc., etc. But ultimately, we need to be able to think about the ideas. We need to be able to critique the past. We need to be able to critique ourselves today. And we need to be able to imagine different possibilities. And, and most of the time, I, I, I would, you know, put put a lot of money on it that it doesn't come down to technological solutions it doesn't come down to technological uh, you know methods for doing things it comes down to imagination and and us being able to see things from different perspectives and and what i feel like is required of me today and, and this is something that i put a lot of pressure on myself to do is to think about things from different angles all the time uh, so for example when we were developing this project i had to sit down and think to myself, all music is needs to be treated equally. All music from all over the world. When we, you know, within this remit of tuning, I have to think about everything on an equal level, whether it be the Renate from uh, Thailand or the Oud or uh, whatever the uh, panpipes from uh, Latin America. They need to be treated with equal respect. And 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 it's not about universalism. It's not about. Uh, you know, trying to find this, you know, magic uh, uh, method for representing all musical cultures in, in a single way. I remember uh, she you mentioned the other day about um, the global tuning, uh, sorry, the global uh, transcription system that has been developed at University of Sheffield, etc. And Are I just... Kidding? Yeah, and I find these these attempts and these ideas so incredibly problematic because we've already been through this, through the whole of Victorian England's history and this idea of trying to universalize the world and standardize the world, it just doesn't work. That's not who we are because ultimately if you, if you it becomes imposition. And, and even what Dr. Posafad mentioned now about the, the nation states having to choose a specific tuning system or an instrument or a musical genre to represent themselves, this is a byproduct purely of the nation state building uh, enterprise that was imposed by uh, colonizing imperialist nations and so 
why you know why is it so hard for us to actually just accept that we have so many nuances and differences and that we need choice nobody's saying one is better than the other just make it all available we need to be able to do whatever we want and it's not it shouldn't be about having to create systems you know even the arab world has suffered from this from the 1932 congress onwards they wanted to standardize the tuning system standardize instrument making because everybody wanted to copy europe my europe is europe let it be and we can do other things we don't have to stick with our past either we can do different things um, and I find this this is the conflict and this is the conflict of imagination and and access to, to resources and information ultimately very good right your PhD in that direction That's I'm sure Graham has lots of ideas already for his PhD um, yeah I, I thought you know I think the beyond um, a problem of imagination I think it's a problem of political economy isn't it, uh, in which colonization um, has uh, um, had a major role to play and which we are still trying to unpick. Um, and I think until we can get to the place where we are able to give um, every single culture its own place and be, you know, own equal place in an ideal recalibrated playing field, we have to think about how to recalibrate the playing field. And right now, as Khayam says, uh, and all of us, I think, have also talked about, there are just so many blocks, the blocks that are preventing Joe's software from reaching lots of people, the blocks that have prevented the fluid piano from being adopted by conservatoires. So where, um, I mean, you could all throw up your hands in despair and say, it's not my problem, it's politicians' problems. But I think we're all equally um, uh, integrated into all the systems uh, that already um, um, uh, are built on hegemonies. And we ourselves as practitioners are, are probably as much guilty of replicating this, these hegemonies as well. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to negotiate. Uh, and this relationship between mathematics, uh, science and music, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But, you know, very... It, I will do a very, very simple task. So Pythagoras himself is known to have come from the island of Samos. I'm just going to share my screen. This is Google Maps, right? So um, Samos obviously is in Greece, right? That's what we that's what we know. And so this is Samos in Greece. But all we have to do here is just zoom out a little bit and we'll start to see that. Where is it actually? This is Greece. This is Samos. This is we're modern day Turkey, right? So even just this idea that Pythagor Pythagoras, you know, is, you know, the Greek who f discovered all of this and, and therefore is the one who uh, helped the development of Western civilization, etc., is built upon this idea in our minds that Greece is the cradle of Western civilization and it, it's this geographic area that is close to Europe. But you saw where the island of Samos is there on the on the map. And and his own biographers have documented that he traveled to Egypt and to Chaldea and studied there for over 20 years until he finally went back to Samos and founded his school at the age of 57. So these these little tiny bits of information, of, of historical information that are brushed under the carpet and not represented, you know, properly, are also the informations that end up lodging themselves in our minds and affecting our worldview. Why are all children's toys tuned to C major equal temperament? I cannot understand it for the life of me. You know, all over the world, children are, are growing up with C major, 12 tone equal temperament as the fundamental uh, 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 like formation of what music is. This is just crazy to me. It's crazy. I'd also like to, you know, point out that parallel to Pythagoras, I mean, Chinese philosophers um, for millennia had already come up with their own version of um, uh, equal temperament. Favorite. Yeah. And come up with the, the Pythagorean, discovered the problem of Pythagorean comma. Um, you know, on China is that there are actually lithophone instruments. So stones that tune stones that go back to 1700 BC that are tuned not only in the Pythagorean, the Pythagorean system, them, which isn't Pythagorean, but also according to just to, to what's called today just intonation, which is the, the 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 relation of intervals to each other as per the harmonic series, 1700 BC. 
Okay, so a couple of comments have come in. Um, first, a question from Satria Utama asking Joe about the Rolly C board. Um, and then a comment from Ritik, I think Weistup, I hope I pronounced that correctly, saying that uh, imagination shouldn't be stopped before because of technical limitations. We need the technology which is able to convert our imagination to something real. I just like to also say that not everyone has the same access to different kinds of technology. And then John Garzoli has said more lamb has been studied by ethnographers like himself and others. The can is tuned to three, two ratios and uses the same method as Pythagorean to eliminate beats and fits. So, you know, we all got there um, alongside Pythagoras or before. Um, more questions um, from the audience. Well, anyone in the panel want to take up the comments? Uh, which comment is this? Any of them. Oh, Do you have a response? Okay. All right. I think we should all relax a little bit huh? because uh, tuning is a mess and, uh, uh, and accept it, you know, but can you sink into it? So even uh, a form like K-pop needed a subtle music education going on to ensure that the ratings and all that were up. But that wasn't discovered till much later. And now it's open. It's an open book because... K-pop is disappearing, but K-pop did not start on their own. K-pop started from Japan pop and then Mandarin pop. All, all came and collapsed, came and collapsed. What is it due to? It's due, it's due to the way the audience appreciates it. So you can manipulate it today. Uh, I don't see why uh, the music profession as we see in academia, cannot look into all this. You see? Now, there are lots of very good questions about Molam. The thing is that uh, all over, uh, John, I, I wish you the best. It's a long time that I saw you. We had some lovely conversations on Skype before with my students in Mahasarakam. I know, I know what you have done. I've read your thesis and uh, I applaud you for that. But uh, the, the young people at Molam, is, uh, they want to change Molam fundamentally. And I, I moved around the universities in Isan. I, I moved. I, I am back in Singapore now. And I think the ground cannot be taught uh, by anybody trying to impose in, in Isan now. It's a different lot of young people. And that, that uh, issue has to be addressed by uh, Isan itself. You see, do they will they have a voice to do it? See, now I have introduced the tremolo, which is a development of the rondalia, into the same regions, and the young people are taking it to great heights. So, sometime next year, I'll bring them all together, not just in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Myanmar, see, in Vietnam. See? So, I would say the, 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 the basic tuning, uh, uh, the whole concept or, or the whole study of tuning is com complex and only a few people can become experts in the theory. But in the practice, you got to go to the makers. You see, and that is what I discovered in Philippines. Nobody knew about tuning. I found different tunings all over for their rondalia. So finally, I had to study what the difference was in cutting the keyboards. And I discovered it. And there is one... Uh, this time it's going backwards to temperament because all the Filipino instruments are cut in uh, 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 not equal temperament, but in really in just intonation. And it was done generations ago. They made templates and now the businesses work on that. But the young people are saying, how come you buy one from the central Philippines and another one in, in, uh, in uh, Luzon and the tuning is different? I said, look here, you go and study. So it's a template. Just a quick, question, a quick, quick reminder that we are closing, uh, coming to um, our two hour mark and we would like to make a call for further questions from the audience. But I wanted to pick up um, your point on uh, Korea and K-pop, Joe, which I think is an important one. I myself don't think K-pop is in any danger of dying out in the next decade, Hopefully. at least. But I think what is really fascinating is how the Korean government has invested very, very heavy in all sorts of K-culture, which means that, as uh, Rose has pointed out with the Jake, Korean tuning systems via the government sponsorship and heavy investment in Pansori, in um, um, Kagok, in Korean 
um, folk song in their festivals and intangible oh. cultural assets alongside its exports of K-pop has meant that a lot of people, including young people in Korea, are versed in, and able to code switch in different ways. Maybe they may not sing pansori, but they they can understand it on Korean terms and reclaim it. And, and you know, it is decolonial in a sense that isn't even necessarily like this is, again, we are... Uh, you know, playing against the West. It's just going out there and saying, this is Korea, full stop. So um, as we're waiting for the final questions to come in, I don't know if, um, Rose, you have any thoughts. You know, Thailand is the only territory that was not colonized <laughs> by any yeah, power in the 19th century. And what wow. is yours? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that statement, I I really have, I, oh. that, that would need another two more days or a week or a month, like Thailand has never been colonized. Okay, but um, I've been waiting to be called in and jump into um, jamming. I, I would like to, you probably, Kiyang, you probably saw me when I pounding my heart when you say the children. And I'm like, what have we been, what have we been doing and done to our children in the music classroom? just western scale just a keyboard when are we going to introduce them uh indian classical song to a very young age we don't have to wait until university students it's too late it is too late and listen to different um different system i would say okay um, back to the question, is a, the term system is a correct one? Um, we could call it a path, because in Thai it is not, it's a term. In Thai music terminology, it's called tang. So the way you play music, the way you explore the sound on each um, instrument. Um, how about us um, listening to... Um, music from Madagascar, listening to music from uh, Portugal, listening to music from uh, Seoul, um, Eskimo, the Inuit, from the very young, not um, because we introduced them, just one a particular uh, theory, one particular system from year one, year two, year three, year four, when are they going to start talking about different kind of music, different kind of instrument, different kind of genre around the world, not just about in geography, not just about in religion classes. Um, so I I was thinking about myself, I would having a lot of fun in music uh, classroom, in music, um, when in back in a childhood, it, um, so that that would be um, something that I, I think it could help decolonized. It could uh, it music education um, could working alongside with ethnomusicologists that we have a lot and 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 a lot of information from research and ethnography. So that could be uh, serve as a base for a textbook to our children in the future. Great. I Can I just, I just add something to what you said about Pansori? Because I, I was in uh, Korea for some time handling the ASEAN Korea Orchestra, which was a multi-million dollar project. Multi-multi-million, you see. But the Pansori players are the highest paid musicians. And I asked them, why? They said, you ensure they, they survive. So you pay them, but you allow freedom elsewhere. You know, what a great logic. And I think uh, here in Thailand too, Ross, please sit down with Kun Tapana from Thai Beverage. He's a wonderful chap. He has set CRCN uh, on its road, uh, bringing uh, talented musicians from this part of the world together to, to really play first. Anand Nakron is there as musical director. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think uh, uh, she, she she likes to read good papers, so you know that's a door open. 
and I, I will support you anytime. See? Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I think if there is any lesson to be learned, it sounds as if uh, um, we need the politicians to create good policies and we need I, the primary school teachers to do I the thought you were a politician, <laughs> always talking about decolonization. You see, that was the hottest topic in political science. Yes, it comes in waves, uh, but I mean, it has always been around as well as uh, Pan Sui Bing has pointed out, you know, people have been doing decolonial projects without necessarily calling it decolonization. Uh, just checking for final questions. We may not have any, but I am sure everyone um, has been very inspired by um, all the many contributions from Joe, from Rose and from Kayam. And you have all their uh, different contacts up there via their website. So hopefully we can continue this conversation. I know that Nusa Sonic is continuing this work. They have an open call and maybe at this point in time, we can draw this um, conversation to a close and, you okay. know, um, give thanks to all our speakers before I oh, hand perfect. the microphone to Maya to talk about Nusa Sonic's further important projects. And we want people to keep on talking. We want people to use Khayam's software to um, access Joe's site, to think about the different um, you know, embracing of many different paths, as Rose has um, pointed out, that is happening in Thailand anyway. So over to you, Maya, and thank you, thank you. our fellow thank you. speakers yeah. and audience for listening and questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for engaging in the last two hours of fruitful exchange. I'd like also to thank you to Shari, Rose, Kiam, Joey for the enriching conversation. Um, or Nusa Sonic working team, Zevan, Rangi, Murph, Chiwai, Cheryl, Wok, Yan, Taisa, and Ingo. See you in another ra next round of Nusa Sonic talk or event. Um, yeah, just like Shari mentioned, just friendly reminder, the open call for common tonalities is still open until tomorrow. For further updates on Nusa Sonic news and activities, please stay tuned to our social media accounts. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.